Daniel also mentioned earlier uh, the Krusty talk. 2015, Swift community, we all met. Apocryphal coworker of Dave Abrams and called him Krusty. And Krusty was gonna teach us all a better way to code, this wonderful way that would let us all use less code, but still get more done. And it was called protocol-oriented programming. I was a little bit skeptical of this at first because I had been coding in Objective-C since 2010. And the main thing I did with protocols was make delegates. It didn't take me a super long time to wrap my head around the delegate pattern because I think at one time or another in our lives or our careers, we've had a boss or a parent or a teacher who has said, listen, kid, I don't care how you do it. Just tell me what the result is when you're done. And I could easily apply this idea to the delegate pattern. Look, contact picker, I don't actually care how you pick contacts, just give me back the contact the user picked and that's all I care about. The idea that you could build an entire programming technique around that idea seemed a little bit far-fetched at first. But then, Dave Abrams dropped one of the last surprise features of the Swift language before it went open source. It was called protocols with default implementations. You could basically say, hey, anything that conforms to this protocol, here's a really basic implementation of it, and centralize and compose your code in a really powerful way. Now, the examples given at that talk were very, very good, but they were also a little bit more abstract than things we have to deal with as iOS developers on a daily basis. So I'm gonna work through some of the increasingly complex and powerful things you can do with protocols with the first thing that I really use protocols with default implementations for in practice. And that was showing a heads up display. This is also known as a HUD. That tells the user, hey, there's something going on and they need to wait. And there's two things that this needs to do. It needs to show the HUD and it needs to hide the HUD. So I made a protocol with two functions and the first one, it would show the HUD given some options in terms of the title or whether or not that showing should be animated, then it would give you back whatever the HUD was that it showed. The second uh, method took a HUD and it hit it with the option to animate the hiding or not. Now, today I'm gonna to be talking about a couple of different types of extensions. I'm gonna to try to call out which I'm talking about as I go. So the first one that I'm gonna be talking about is the default protocol implementation extension. This is sort of an abstract extension that can be used by anything that declares it conforms to the protocol you've created this default implementation for. For the sake of length, I'm just going to be referring to this as a default implementation. In this case, the default implementation I created did the very basic work of showing and hiding the HUD using the passed in values. So how do you know this is default implementation? Because the de declaration is simply an extension on the protocol type with no other details. And then what the default implementation actually did was pretty simple. The show method sized the HUD based on the passed in view. Then it added it as a subview using the parameters that were passed in. The hide method hid the passed in HUD, then removed it from its super view with the animation or lack of animation as specified by the animated parameter when that completed. Now in default implementations, you can do some fun things that you can't actually do directly in a protocol declaration, like adding default values for a parameter. If you're showing and hiding a HUD, it's gonna be animated. So I let, set the default value of the animated parameter to true for both hiding and showing. You can also add certain annotations that you can't necessarily add in the protocol definition, like adding a discardable result annotation. This is telling the compiler, I'm not necessarily always going to need access to the HUD that I'm returning from here, so it doesn't need to create a warning if the value returned from this method is unused. And now, anything conforming to HUD showing that calls into this default implementation gets all of this behavior, including the default values and the discardable result, for free. Now it's time to actually use this default implementation in a concrete class. I said, okay, I wanna keep the actual default implementation of the protocols methods, but I wanna create a class called AView. And I made it conform to HUD showing so that it got access to all of those pretty default implementations that I already added. And I added a similar but not identical method to the default extension, just passing the current instance of the view class through the default extension. Now, one important thing to note here is that even though the method signature is similar, it does not exactly match the one in the protocol, so it's not actually overriding the default implementation, it's just calling through to it. So similarly, in the hide method, I used a convenience method to grab whatever HUD was in the current instance of a view. If it existed, 
I used the default protocol implementation to hide it. And lo and behold, it worked. I had a view that showed a HUD using the default implementation. But then I realized with another feature of default implementations, this doesn't just have to be for one subclass. This can be for any UI view subclass. So instead of having that same convenience code in extension on a view, I kept the rest of the code identical, but I changed the declaration so that it was a default implementation with a where clause. And going forward, I'm going to be referring to this as a conditional default implementation. Since it says, this is the default implementation uh, for, for, for something, but only in this particular case. In this case, the condition was, whatever is conforming to this extension must be in the inheritance tree of UI view. And then magically, with one line of additional code, I was able to get exactly the same behavior in all different kinds of views, as long as they either directly or indirectly inherited from UI view. Now, the nice thing about this method is that if I don't want every single view that I'm working with to have this functionality, I can write one line of code per subclass that said, OK, give this particular view this functionality. And that was really, really neat. But then I thought, well, what if you wanted the default implementation to be able to be used on any UI view, even a plain vanilla one? Good news is, we already have a way to do that, which is to just create an extension on an existing type which conforms to the protocol. I refer to this as just a vanilla extension. This is something we're all used to doing on standard library types, even without protocol-oriented programming, and it works even if you're not necessarily doing it to conform to a protocol. The difference is that here, because it conforms to the protocol, the extension is able to take advantage of the default implementation of that protocol. The actual code showing and hiding the view is still centralized in HUD showing's default implementation. And so now, I could just instantiate any plain vanilla UI view, and it would have the ability to show and hide the HUD. Even if I had a subclass that did some additional setup, it still got this HUD showing behavior absolutely for free. So, so far, you've got a UI view extension able to be used on any UI view or other uh, item in its inheritance tree, calling into the default implementation of the HUD showing protocol. And then I realized having a different conditional default implementation or another thing with a where clause would allow me to have HUD showing have default behavior in selected UI view controllers. I couldn't use the extension I just made on UI view on the view controller itself, but I could use a where clause to write identical helper methods to the UI view extension. Then I could just use the view controller's view to call through to the UI view extension with the passed in values. From there, everything kept going back up the chain as it had before. Now, this worked really, really well in certain circumstances, but it had some unexpected behavior in others. Now, unfortunately, the code for this gets really, really long, so I will direct you to a link to a playground that shows how these examples are set up, uh, and I'll tweet this out after, after the talk as well. For now, you will have to take the word of myself and my lovely video and see that when the default implementation I showed you before is run in a, nav, uh, a view controller with no tab, no nav bar, works totally fine. But when it's run in that same view controller that is in a nav bar, the nav bar isn't actually covered by the HUD. Same problem happens when there's a tab bar. And in the case where you don't want the user to be able to interact with the app while this behind the scenes work is done, this is a little bit of a problem, especially if it's in a nav controller or it is in turn in a tab controller, because then the user has access to both. So I realized you need to find the view controller's outermost enclosing controller, whether it was a tab or a nav itself. And then show the HUD in that controller's view instead of always using the current view controller's view. Now, when I ran the exact same code in the program and the playground, and you'll have to take my word that it's the same, I still got the same behavior that I wanted on a plain view controller. But I also got the behaviors that I wanted when that same view controller is embedded in a nav bar or in a tab bar, or potentially in both. So now, as we've gone through and we've created this, this sort of Frankenstein thing, where are we at in the, in the layers? We have a conditional default implementation of HUD showing on a UI view controller, calling into a UI view extension, which calls into the default implementation for HUD showing. So we are three layers deep in protocol land. But, of course, as our friend Leo would tell us, that is not enough, we have to go deeper. What if you want to use a protocol in something, but only when that thing conforms to another protocol? 
Going back to the app that I was working on, because of the way that the API was set up, we had a lot of things for which we needed to update the user's details before we displayed it something. And so I made a protocol which handled fetching the user's details from the network and then handling any error which might have occurred in the process. And since every one of the things which needed this functionality was a, was a view controller, I decided to make a conditional default extension on UI view controller. Pretty standard stuff, fetching data with the, from the network, calling a completion block when it shows up, and then handling the error under the hood if one has happened. The problem was that it looked a little crappy. Because I had abstracted away handling the starting and completion of this network operation, I couldn't really do anything with a HUD that was going to work without using local implementations of the methods that I was trying to provide these default implementations for. And then I started, well, maybe, maybe I can pass the HUD from the, from the concrete implementation, and, and then before I, call, uh, before I call fetch user details, and then maybe there's a way to like, have it pass that through to the completion block. And then I realized, well, wait a minute. If the view controller already conforms to HUD showing, you can just use those methods directly. So I updated the where clause to say that any view controller taking advantage of this default implementation also had to conform to HUD showing. And then I just used the methods that I had previously provided by HUD show, with HUD showing to deal with showing and hiding the HUD. And finally, I had my nice pretty HUD right where I wanted it, and this was now completely reusable across view, view controllers. So now, to review, we have user details fetching, default implementation for uh, UI view controllers, but only UI view controllers, which conform to HUD showing, calling into the conditional default implementation of HUD showing for UI view controllers, calling into an extension on UI view, calling into the default implementation of HUD showing, and that is enough layers to make Leo a very happy man. And I will admit that when I say all of these things out loud, it actually seems a lot more complicated than it is. That's because the complication is completely within the setup. In use, the only thing you need to do to make any UI view controller in your project be able to fetch user details and show a HUD while it's doing it is adding these two lines of conformance. By omitting any implementation, you can take advantage of either default implementation or a qualifying conditional default implementation. This is a super powerful mix-in architecture, and it allows you to build small pieces of functionality which can be added to any view controller like Lego blocks, but without having to make a specific UI view controller subclass. In essence, what you're getting is subclass-like behavior without subclassing. Again, if you want to make that user details fetching protocol work on a table view controller subclass or a collection view controller subclass or any direct or indirect subclass of UI view controller that you want, all you have to do is add two conformances with no other code and you are done. You get the same ability to centralize your code and therefore your bugs and avoid repeating yourself without having to create a really screwy inheritance chain or add similar methods to UI view and UI table view and UI collection view. You do all of this without an inheritance tree that would confuse even historians of the most repeatedly intermarried lines of European royalty. However, like anything that is tremendously powerful and seems a little bit like magic, there are a few pitfalls that you need to watch out for. And I'm going to demonstrate the biggest one of these to all of you in the form of a pop quiz. Haha, <laughs> you're all in that nightmare where you're about to have a test you didn't prepare for. So given a protocol which defines a single method and which has a default implementation with an additional function and a concurrent implementation which uh, overrides both methods in the default implementation, if I create an instance of that concrete implementation and tell it to say hi, Ask, how are you? What's it going to print out here? Et voilà! Bonjour, le monde. Comment allez-vous? The expected result. That was the easy part. This is the harder part. How about when I make this one little change, I tell the compiler, hey, this is an object which conforms to the greeter protocol. What is this going to print out now? And the answer is, bonjour, le monde. How are you? What? <laughs> so what the hell is going on here? The issue is what type the compiler thinks French is here. With type in, without the explicit type enter, in, uh, without, without the explicit type annotation, type inference allows the compiler to determine that French is of the type French greeter. At runtime, the compiler looks at the two possibilities, and the function in the default implementation that is not required by the protocol is ignored, and the function on the class is called directly. 
Well, when you specify that French's type is just the greeter type, the compiler says, aha, this is simply of type greeter. Unless the actual type of French is overriding a method that is specified in the protocol definition, I don't need to care what the actual type of the object is being in there. I can just point straight to the default implementation. So at runtime, for the function that was declared in the protocol extension, it goes to the lowest implementation on the chain, and it uses the implementation in the concrete extension. But for the function which was only declared in the de default implementation, it decides, well, since this is not part of the actual protocol, I don't need to know or care whether anything else happens with this further down the chain, and it discards the implementation in the concrete class, leaving it to call the generic default implementation, leaving you with an unintentionally bilingual greeter. And this is all performing as designed. It is also totally not what I would have expected initially. So particularly when you are debugging or trying to figure out why something's not getting called in certain circumstances, watch out for this. It will bite you. Another common problem, and this is one that I keep tripping on myself constantly, is the problem of using protocols as a hammer and seeing every problem as a nail. Uh, I ran into this problem literally last week uh, on the project that I'm working on. I was trying to make a sort of a custom disappearing nav bar. And the app that I'm working on involves cryptocurrency, so naturally it involves CryptoKitties. And I initially tried to implement this design as a protocol with a de de default implementation. So both view controllers and UI views could work with it. And it worked really great right up until I had to support iPhone 10. It turned out that I needed to know when safe area insets changed or I would not be able to work th make this work at all on iPhone 10. And about the same time I had to fix that, I realized that in order to make the pop gesture recognizer work for a navigation controller, I had to set its gesture recognizer delegate to something that would tell it it would always recognize. And I wound up tying myself in knots, trying to make this work for both views and view controllers. In every view controller I had it in, I was overriding safe area layouts did change, calling the same method on the protocol, then setting, setting up the gesture recognizer the same way in every single, sub, every single class that this was being applied to. And at a certain point, the third time I was doing this, I was like, well, wait a minute. What are the actual chances that this is going to be used in a vanilla UI view? The answer is they were vanishingly tiny. Because I was trying to be super flexible, I had wound up making my life so much harder because I was forcing myself to find all of these lifecycle methods that really should have just been overridden. And it also scattered my code everywhere, completely defeating the point of centralizing the code. So I want to leave you all today with some quick guidelines I've come up with after banging my head against enough walls about when to use default implementations versus extensions versus subclasses. I'll note for default implementation, I mean both overall default implementations that apply to anything declaring conformance to your protocol or conditional default implementations which only work in certain circumstances. You may ask yourself, do I need this to work on all instances and or subclasses of a particular thing? If you do, write an extension. Then it's gonna be flexible enough to be applied all the way through the inheritance tree. Next, ask yourself, do I need this to work only when I say it should or in a particular combination of circumstances? In this case, indeed, what you are looking for is a default implementation. It might be a vanilla default implementation or it could be conditional you are going to have to work, work out what works best for you. Finally, if you realize that the thing you desperately, desperately, desperately want to be a protocol needs to always be called from a specific lifecycle or delegate method, suck it up and subclass. The biggest thing with protocols is that if you choose your tools wisely, if you really think through what you're trying to do and what the best approach is, you will have phenomenal cosmic power all crammed in to an itty-bitty code space. Merci beaucoup.